going to let you all kind of fall in here like normal. <laughs> on our screen, you can see Oscar and William. Man, you all are logging in fast. You were on top of things today. All right, so just real quick from me, I'm Skylar with Lane Frontiers. I will send you a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. That does come directly from me. So make sure you do check your email for that. And um, Oscar, I believe we are kind of slowing down so you can go ahead and take over. <laughs> Well said. I notice it's the top of the hour. Skylar, thank you. And as I always say, Skylar, thank you very much for the work that goes on behind the scenes to make these things happen. It's, it's a, People just log on, bang, like me, 10 minutes ago, and like William, and others logging on now. And that's all we see. Um, but there's a fair bit that goes on to bring it to this point. So thanks again, as always. So I just quickly introduce William Harvey. William's continuous improvement is a continuous improvement practitioner coach and his plant manager. University professor at Michelin, uh, who strives to daily to develop leaders to lead transformational change that contribute to the greater good. But more importantly, um, over the last 12 months, there's been a group of us that's met together um, virtually at 3.30 Eastern Standard Time every Friday. And uh, William has been a regular part of that. And one of the things, and we talk about development of people and um, and leadership and the likes. And uh, the story that William has has been one of the underlying themes, one of, something we've gone back to quite a bit. And it's, it's really a very, very interesting one and well worth sharing. So that's what this is about. Uh, it's really bringing this to light to more than just our little group of uh, eight or t uh, six or eight people. So William, let's get started. How did you first you realize you had a problem that needed handling with uh, what we've referred to as Mr. Supervisor now? Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Skylar. And thank you for everybody joining in today. Really excited to share really lessons from me while I'll talk about Mr. Supervisor now. These are really the development that I went through with Oscar and those others mentioned. I do see a couple of those attendees logged in today. So thank you all for your input. When I go back to Oscar's question, he talks about when did you first realize there was a problem? comes like many of us, we get in that supervisory role and that's the, I would say the most challenging but best two years. And for me, the problem showed up when the results weren't as expected and the opinions that Mr. Supervisor now had of what happened differed drastically from what I experienced and what his peers experienced. So for Mr. Supervisor now, there was a, a disconnect between what was actually happening versus the perceptions that he held. Yeah, spot on. So therefore, in thinking about this, what was... When you had that realization, I guess, what was your first step? My first step was actually to ask other people if their experiences were similar. So one of the things I'm mindful of is checking my own assumptions. And saying experiences were similar. In other words, did they have a similar view of how Mr. Supervisor was going, right? Correct. So for me, checking my own assumptions was important to go to the Oscars of the world in my immediate work group and say, hey, is this how it's showing up? Or is this just misguided from my perspective? And the... The good news is enough of us saw the same thing, so enough of us were able to support Mr. Supervisor now as he went through the process of helping him. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. And what about him? At what point did you raise your concerns? Yeah, so for me, it was a, a question right out of the how to handle a problem from the JR card that you prompted, Oscar, and that was around his feelings. So when I asked Mr. Supervisor now, how are you feeling about this? It was that moment that for me, I was able to understand the person differently and understand the stresses that came with this new role. So from a, a problem perspective, that was really helpful because now we're on the same page to say, let's approach it from that way. And what we really focused on, on was how do you help the person experience joy in a day in and day out way versus yeah, it just right. being like, I feel stressed because of the new work. And there's obviously new technical stuff that we all learn in management. In this instance, not only do you have to deal with the new technical stuff, you also have to deal with all the new social stuff with how do you manage people and what do those challenges look like when they get presented to the supervisor. Yeah, sure. So just to rewind then, therefore, you know, you've mentioned JR. Um, what was the object? What was your objective? As soon as when this popped up and you, you know, you realized you had to handle it, what was the uh, what what became your objective? And what is your objective? Yeah, for me it was to get the person to experience joy most days that it came to work. Yeah, and right. uh, the frustrations that any of us felt were really my obstacles. So for me, it was really saying the objective was joy. 
then it was looking and saying, okay, how do we uncover those obstacles? Because in certain spaces, the individual wasn't ready to deal with the problem because they just didn't have the skills yet. And other times it was just, you know, awareness lacking or lacking, or lacking awareness that created some of the challenge. Sure. And um, so just uh, part of part of that rewind, what level of recognition was there, did you say, with, with Mr. Supervisor himself? When you got so, opinions and feelings? It, it was a series of steps, I think, for anybody. And when I was in a similar position, I'll start, probably answer better from that way. When a, you know similar information was presented to me, I had to go through and just deal with those emotions that came. And I think that yeah, was right. the journey over a few, a few sessions. And I think once Mr. Supervisor now realized it wasn't a critical comment, but rather a helpful group of people that wanted to see him excel, it changed the approach because it wasn't, you know, you're coming at me. It's okay. I recognize the gap. Let's work on this together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, his response initially? Like a lot of people, including mine, it was resistance. Like, you know, I'm not the problem. It's everybody else. Yeah, and right. in that initial response, that resistance was something I expected and something that we had worked through in those first few sessions. Yeah, okay. So that's interesting you raised that. Um, Sarah Kayla raised a question when she submitted uh, her registration. She said, how do you handle behaviours I have that, that have been there for many years and they resist those changes? So how did you, when there was the resistance, how did you, what, what was your attack there? So for me, it was the call into question, you know, is there awareness? And I think that's the most important piece to go toward change. And if you reject other people's opinions, it you never gain that awareness. So once yeah, the right. awareness was gained, it really became a, you know, what was out there to motivate this person to change. And what I found was once the awareness was there, the motivation was there You know, from day one. I do want to do well for my team. I do want to excel at the organization. And with that, I was able to accomplish what I was after. <clears throat> And how long ago was this? When was that? So at what stage were you at that part of the cycle? Yeah, so this this journey is about a six to seven month journey. And that was in those first two weeks that we're yeah, going yeah, through right. the resistance piece to the, the recognition of how do you, you know, what do I do differently? Because it's one thing to be told, we, we don't like this behavior. It's another thing to be saying or to say, you know, these are leadership behaviors we expect and they look yes. like this. And that second part was really helpful. Because I think if I framed it in just don't do this, it doesn't really help the person learn and know what to go after. Yeah, okay. Can you tell us more about those leadership behaviours? Are they a standard Mickelman thing or were they things you already had uh, lined up? You know, is it part of a policy or uh, something internal? Where did that come from? Yeah, so for us, the, the good news is they are rather explicit. And we do call out leadership attributes very clearly. So for me, as I internalize those, there's always a, a discussion of how, but there is a common aim where I think everybody could get in the room and say, you know, that happened or that didn't happen. And it was really objective. Yeah, right. But were they a standard, were they, were they a, a, did you already have a standard list of you know, leadership behaviors? Yes, that's what I'm sharing. There, there is a standard list, yes. Yeah, yeah. Those right. are the expectations we share with leaders. Okay. So Tucker Cast has submitted a question just now. It's a, he says, I love your emphasis on trying to understand their motivation. How do you discover their mo How did you discover Mr. Supervisor's motiv motivation? What questions did you ask? Was there any validation? How did you go about that? What did you do to find what, out what makes him tick? I think that's what Tucker Cast is getting at. Yeah, so for anybody who hasn't explored a concept known as motivational interviewing, that's what I'm describing in so many ways now. And essentially you say, I've got, you know, on one end, my current condition and then the desired condition to be the opposite spectrum. So what I've learned to do is figure out what they desire or this person desires and then help them go toward that change. Sure. And one of the things that I would share is oftentimes what we'll do is push people <laughs> against what they like to do or, or gain resistance. What I found is it's a futile thing. So when people don't want to change, I've got to figure out what would motivate them. In this case, it was using that person's language and their desires to say, okay, well, now that we know what that looks like and we can both describe it similarly, let's go after that together. And that was, a, I think, a huge thing for me in that change environment. And I would say really all change environments when it's one-on-one. -on -one. So in this particular case, you've spoke about that gap, you know, current condition and, um, and where you need the person to be. Uh, and, and then the capability, I guess, how well did that gap and 
the potential capability of Mr. Supervisor fit with the with the with the role he was he he needed to fulfill. So the the gap for me was very clear. The the challenge for me was helping other people, in this case, Mr. Supervisor now, recognize a similar gap. And yeah, right. a lot of times it's, you know, the the answers I get from Mr. Supervisor now and a bunch of others is, well, somebody else did this. You know, that yeah, right. you're dismissed. And it's like, well, that's not really true, right? Because I'm having a private conversation with others just the same, saying that isn't a behavior we expect. And in the the clarity that Mr. Supervisor now had was there. We sat down and really made sure we understood it from both perspectives, right? Here's what I'm trying to say to Oscar and Oscar back. You know, are you repeating back to me what I'm saying? And once we yes. had a you know level set there, it was time to go into problem solving, but we weren't ready yeah. to go until we agreed what the problem was. Yeah, exactly. And did he, was Mr. Supervisor, was he, to what degree was he comfortable when he understood what a good supervisor looks like? Uh, to what degree was he comfortable with that? Can you tell us a little bit about that? And did you have to move him in any way in that area? How did that all fit? Because that can be quite tricky. Yeah, so the, the comfort was certainly not there in the beginning. So I would yeah. say the, the first, you know, four to six weeks of the process were the most challenging for me. And, you know, once we got over the hurdle of, yes, we agree there's a problem, it became a lot of, well, what do I do? And I would say yeah, even so for I... me as the person's leader, I didn't have all the answers. Yeah, and right. I think that was a, an important piece is just saying, I don't know what it will cause, you know, what, what you need to do to change, but I can say here are behaviors that I've seen work. Here's how I'm working through it. Offered some consult to peers around the organization who I say, you know, I'm not very good at that, but, you know, Oscar is. Please go ask Oscar because he's got some really effective strategies that he deploys. Yeah, and right. once, the, once the problem was understood and there was a view of like there is help or there's a, a point of hope, it became a lot easier. And then yeah, I call right. that the you know, next six to eight weeks were actually really joyful because it changed from <laughs> there's a problem to, hey, look at what I'm learning. Look what I'm uncovering. Look at how effective my team is. And really, I, I base that off of that process of starting the question with, how do you feel about this? And yeah, right. in that moment, it was a huge thing. And until our conversation, Oscar, with that wisdom circle on Friday afternoons, I wasn't thinking, go ask about the person's feelings. I was yeah, really right. thinking about, here's a problem. Let's go fix, fix a tactical thing. Only realized that probably wouldn't got me as far as asking that one question. Yes. It's an interesting point, that, isn't it? I mean, one of my biggest learnings from job relations, maybe not learning, acceptance, is that how people think and how they're feeling are facts to them. So what we, I think we have a tendency to um, try and change that rather than accept it for what it is and understand that it is part of the story and that's what we've got, so that's what we have to work with. How did you go with that? Did you find, you know, you personally, uh, is that something you've found reasonably easy to get your head around or not so? Not for me, Oscar. I, <laughs> not I, me I, either. I, no, I, I just don't think that way. So to me, yeah. I just see a very tactical problem. Like, I'm not getting what I want, change something. Yeah. So a lot of the counsel from many is just like, well, asking about how does a person feel about a situation and it's not my natural state to go to. So for me, it's yes. a behavior I have to be very deliberate about practicing. Otherwise, I won't. And then yes. part of it is not being mechanical either, because if I just walk in and go, how are you feeling? But it sounds robotic. It's different than having genuine concern for people. So for me, I had to go from you know feeling like a robot to saying, you know, I genuinely care about the person's answer. I want to know how yes. they're feeling because I need to take that into consideration when I'm grasping the current condition. And I think it's interesting. I'm thinking out aloud as you say it. But I think what you're doing by understanding people's opinions and feelings, and you might want to comment, is that what you start doing then is coming from the pro coming is addressing the problem from their viewpoint rather than your rather than yours or mine. So the goal we agree on, mm -hmm. our objective, but we now start coming at it from their viewpoint rather than what our interpretation of their viewpoint or our own viewpoint. What do you think about that? The goal remains the same. Yeah, I think it's spot on. And the, the way that I, I've heard it used in sales cycles when I used to be in sales was those are objections for the person. So even yes, if we both right. agree that's a good goal, I have an objection. Like, I don't have the time. I just, you know, I don't know how to do that. I don't have the knowledge or I don't have the support. I don't feel I have the support. And yeah. once I was able to uncover each of those objections, I could remove one more barrier and then really highlight where we focused on that goal. And it didn't matter whether or not I thought somebody was good at something or not, or Mr. Supervisor was, it was he had to feel comfortable that he was good enough at it and had the support. So for me, yes. it was making sure those were verbalized from a support perspective and there was something actionable that he could do. 
Yeah, exactly. So I think, uh, and you've sort of highlighted it, what you just said then, I think another trap we fall into with JR, because we're taught it that way, is it's four steps, solve the problem. We tend to think, it, it's sort of taught that way, you know, do the, um, you get the facts, weigh and decide, take action, follow up, problem gone. Mm -hmm. No, that isn't the case, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. And so the, uh, there's so a number of... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. There's a number of cycles in there. So can you tell us about a couple of the things that happened during that, you know, that PDCA cycling that's happening in JR? It's sort of a continuous thing, isn't it, as you head towards the objective? It doesn't, it's not just one cycle tick the objective, it's several cycles as we head towards it. And some will take you backwards. So can you tell yeah. us about a couple of things that happened in there? Yeah, I'll say one huge lesson learned for me, which was, uh, you know, an observation during a meeting which is, you know, we go from interrupting people to being completely silent. And I recall going to that wisdom circle on Friday saying, hey, here's what happened. It's just not working. Right. And then, you know, that group at the time was like, well, maybe this is how the person's processing it. So maybe they went to the other extreme because they're trying to find balance. And to me, that yes. was an important point because I didn't get there in my first step with that person. It was, you know, two or three steps of saying, okay, here's how we get through a meeting and iterate toward that improvement because we were level setting on that specific behavior. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're just, just. I think I remember the discussion. You were expecting some form of action, whereas um, one of the uh, behaviours you you observed with Mr. Supervisor was he tended to jump in and give answers. Mm -hmm. So I think, if I recall it right, you um, were expecting what he then did was shut up, mm -hmm. which is what we were sort of asking him or hoping. But uh, it came across odd when he did that. Is that right? Yeah. Saying that it, it felt unusual, but he was actually heading in the right direction. Yeah, it was. And I think about it in just a calibration of any of our behaviors, right? Yes. If I'm too extreme on one end, it's me trying to find that you know, balance in the middle, saying, okay, here's the right way to show up in any of these meetings. And in that instance, it was you know, a few, what I'll perceive as setbacks, right? They didn't get there as fast as I wanted. However, yes. they were the necessary learning steps to get to a good level. Exactly. Life. Yeah, first cycle, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> and I, th I think David Marquet says that, doesn't he? In that, um, you know, when he's talking about these Santa Fe as a leader, first thing, shut up. <laughs> uh, I, I listened to that last night for um, uh, because I was sending it to someone else, and it always re sort of reminds me. Um, and it also reminds me of something I fit been very well with JR, which is listen with intent to understand, not reply. And I think we all listen with intent to re reply. So after he um, did that, what was the next sort of phase he went through? If you do you recall what 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 happened after that as Mr. Supervisor? Yeah, a lot of it was I would say getting the necessary knowledge to perform. So right. when I think about all those you know issues that came up, there were you know you know they, you could have gone ten different directions. But I think what was really awesome, uh, Mr. Supervisor now picked one and said, let's go work on this one this week. Was that you know, technical then, knowledge, William? Was that technical specific to the, to the air work area? It was actually both. So it was social and technical. So uh -huh. uh, a social perspective was I'm going to go try this in a meeting. From a technical perspective, I was going to go learn a certain skill and practice. And I think yeah, with right. that deliberate practice, the Mr. Supervisor now was able to advance a little bit faster than how we just said, hey, there are five, six things I got to go work on this week. Let's do a little bit on each. So yeah, I think right. the key takeaways with that behavioral improvement was let's pick one, let's get good at that before we start trying to bring in too many other things. So, so have, where the technical stuff you can probably access from you know resources at work and you know people that are reasonably close in the area, the technical stuff. But what about you've mentioned the social stuff? Where was he um, accessing you know behavioral? Um, uh, uh, ideas and all that as far as the social stuff where was that coming from how did you source the resource that for him yeah so this is one of the the beauties of having a really strong network internally and we have a lot of brilliant people and those brilliant people can solve those social challenges so it's right. actually partnering with those you know peer network of peers and those team members who had more experience in management were able to offer counsel from the perspective here's how you can deal with a problem similar yes. and then on the other side just say HR law and the basics of how do we deal with issues, I found a lot of value and so did Mr. Supervisor now partnering with our HR team. So yeah, right. me, when I get to the point where I don't know the answer, it's like, well, I think <laughs> X, Y, Z could happen and I don't yeah. have any confidence or experience, then I'll stop and say, let's go talk to HR. 
make sure we're aligned on the messaging and that we're obviously following laws. And with you know that peer network and our HR team, which is also part of the peer network, I think those resources were very helpful in how to deal with certain issues. Yes. And without those, it would have been a much more challenging thing because reading a supervisor textbook isn't the same as dealing with real problems on a day-to-day yeah, exactly. So to what extent, therefore, if there was other departments or other people that became involved in Mr. Supervisor Now's journey, for want of a better word, you would have needed to have briefed them, I suppose, as to what was going on. How did you? What did you need to do to lay the groundwork for that to be effective? To lay this, you know, to fertilize the soil for that to be effective. Yeah, so for me, the two of the most overlooked steps out of any type of problem solving come from steps one and two in A3 thinking, and it's clarify right. the problem and break down the problem. Right. So I mentioned earlier that we talked about gaining agreement on what the problem was. Yeah. Once we were able to gain agreement, we could have said, here are 50 things for any of us to go work on, but we yeah. knew that wasn't going to work. So we said, here are the key behaviors we want to see improve. And with that, we had that alignment internally when we began. So yeah, right. there weren't five or six messages from five or six different people. It was, here's a consistent message delivered. Here's the support that we can work through JR to achieve both the social and technical side. So... Um... That must have been communicated. That must have been a communicated across to your level of management or that support. The background, you must have needed to do that, did you, to make sure that, that people understood why, where he was coming from and why he might have been you know, looking for these social hints, for want of a better word. Correct. And I think it goes back to you know, asking people for help when you need it. So yeah, and exactly. the, and the, you know, for me, it was, is this just my perception? I'm newer to the organization, so it's not really fair for me to say this is how it should be. It was all yes. of a sudden saying, how do we work? And yes. by answering how do we work, you say, is there a disconnect in how other people work? And if there is, we can address it. If there was a disconnect yeah. with my perception, that's something that you know, I would have to work through personally. But in this instance, there were a few you know, key people that said, you know what? Yes, we see it. Yes, we can help. Let's go help Mr. Supervisor. Sure, sure. Um, James Clark has submitted a question and it says, as plant manager, have you rolled this out across your organisation and have you d direct reports, businesses, leaders, received it, et cetera? I think James is probably referring to job relations. Well, you're not doing that, are you? You're not, no. So so it's more your pattern of thinking at this stage or it's the pattern of thinking you're developing. Just can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, so two things. What we're focused on right now is job instruction. Largely, if I look at the organization, we don't have a problem where JR seems to be the right countermeasure. So JR isn't yet the thing that I need to work on. But when I think about JR, it is something that I plan to share with the leadership team to say, hey, how do we use this to help develop our supervisors, particularly when they're in those first critical two years? Yes. And then the rest of this is saying, okay, well, where do you take it next? And the answer is, I don't know yet because the problem hasn't presented. So yeah, a lot of people ask me, like, what's your, you know, your step seven? Reality is I'm still stuck on step one. So once I achieve the first objective, then it's saying, okay, let's level set, review the current landscape, and then apply our thinking. Sure, sure. So, James, just for clarity's point, um, William was practicing, if you like, the application of uh, practicing the pattern of JR with Mr. Supervisor specifically. It's not an organisational thing. Now, I know you, and your language has already communicated it. I know you've seen parallels between uh, that JR pattern and scientific thinking and the Toyota Carter patterns, is, which is a means of developing scientific thinking. Do you just want to comment on that, please? Yeah, so absolutely. The, the part I see when I chat with most Toyota Kata practitioners and those that are practicing scientific thinking through Toyota Kata will often discuss problems as performance problems or process problems, which is in itself true the way that Mike Rother rolled it out. What I found a lot of value in is it actually helps with learning goals and behavioral change. Yes. And specifically the back of the card where you ask the four reflection questions, that's to me where the meat of Toyota Kata comes in. And that's how I'm helping people through questions put together a different mental model. And I never want to say correct or better because I can't really say that's true. But what I can no. say is we're getting closer to accurate based on those conversations and reflections. And what it's enabled me to do was go through each of the coaching cycles to say, you know, we have an objective or a short-term goal this week to do X. How did they go? What did you expect to happen? And what actually happened? And at that mm -hmm. point, we're able to level set at the end of each week and say, did we achieve what we set out to? And are we ready to go to the next obstacle? And yeah, by virtue yeah. of that, I found a lot of success because it supported where Mr. Supervisor now was at with focus. And then I was able to just put this right in, you know, from a coaching perspective. A key point, though, I'd share Oscars. I didn't teach the person Toyota Kata. 
I just yeah. went through the process as the coach using the pattern because the yeah. pattern of thinking is what is important for me. Not did we have a perfect storyboard? It was more of yeah, a just exactly. pick a goal, let's measure it, and let's go forward. <clears throat> so I'm sure our time's getting low, but I'm sure everyone's thinking, where are we at now with Mr. Supervisor? So where we're at with Mr. Supervisor is a lot of success. The, the, the social challenges, like I said, they're new for everybody, but those are no longer an issue. And from a technical perspective, there are some key things in the person's work development plan and internal HR development process where those are addressing some of the future, or I don't want to call needs, but future desires for Mr. Supervisor. And it's a, it's a good balancing act between the, the two areas. And then I think from the, the way in which we work, that peer network, particularly with our HR team, improved a lot. And I think more for more than anything, we don't rely on our HR pros enough. Yep, that's yeah, where right. their experience is. So it's like, well, go ask their input because they understand dynamics. They understand what's going on in the organization that I, of course, don't know because I'm not privy to all those conversations and get a lot of really wonderful advice from our HR teams. And we started off with, you know, the fundamental thing was for him to have a better day. Mr. Supervisor, if I was to ask him about his days now compared to seven or eight months ago, what do you think he, what answer do you think he'd give me? So I would say it's improved. And the, the way that I would say it's improved, and this is a, I was new a couple of years ago, and I saw that Mr. Supervisor was working a lot of late hours. And then I talked to Mr. Supervisor, Mr. Supervisor was doing a lot of other people's work. And then Solving Mr. the problems problem, himself. Yes. So when Mr. Supervisor realized the power of his team, the team started solving problems. When Mr. Supervisor stopped solving other people's problems and said, hey, this is really yours, I'm willing to help, the, the work hours came down. And because the work hours uh -huh. came down, Mr. Supervisor was, was able to focus on what he thought was important in his work and his team. And to me, that was huge because we weren't just chasing tasks, we we're chasing meaningful objectives. Beautiful. So there's an underlying um, uh, thought or mantra through job relations, which is results through people. So I think what you've just said then is a pretty good illustration of that. Uh, what have you learned? What's the greatest thing you've learned through this Mr. Supervisor now journey, for want of a better word? I don't like that word. So for me, the be patient. Yeah, right. I, I think in a lot of ways, it's like, well, I know what to do, but I, I also have more experience in specific situations. And by be patient, I don't mean in just the pretend version of it, like I'm going to work through this slowly, but being patient, being there to listen, to understand really grasp the current condition to the point you made Oscar about what is it like from their perspective? Yes. And that to me has been the journey over the last five years specifically where I said, go get better at that because that's going to make me show up better as a leader. And to me, that's been the, the thing that's reinforcing. And then I would say the simplification of JR, it's so powerful. Yeah, right. Before JR, I said, we don't need it in my organization. Went through JR personally as a trainee and got coached through it. And I go, holy cow, I missed how beautiful this can be despite its simplicity. So for yes. me, I look at it as a foundational skill for new supervisors <clears throat> and excited when we start promoting new people into the supervisor role, can we use this as a method to get them trained up faster to deal with problems and to equally you know, recognize really good work when it's out there? Spot on. Thank you. And uh, just a question from an, uh, Amanda Wright, and I don't know if this ties in here because you haven't mentioned it yet, how to get new supervisors and even established ones to use data to make better decisions in the moment. So has this cropped up with Mr. Supervisor? Has that been something that's popped up there or or what's your wider experience on that? In, in certain instances, the short answer is yes. The part I'll go back to is can I quantify the problem? Yeah, and if right. I can't quantify the problem, then I have just opinions going back and forth about what should be. Yeah, and the right. way that I'll deal with issues that aren't as easy as, say, like a defect count or something like productivity metrics is do two reasonable people see the same thing? Right. If two reasonable people see the same thing, I'll say I'll count that as a an observation that's reliable. And then yes. I'll use that as the discussion point. So that's so, your approach. But I think what Amanda was getting at is how do we get how, have you had any experience with getting supervisors to think that way? Well, and it is, and it's through, yeah, it's through steps one and two of A3 thinking. Let's yeah, write right. it down on a whiteboard uh, and paper. You know, here's yeah, the right. goal, here's where we're at. Is there a gap or not? The number yes. of times I've seen problem, people say there's a problem, but only to realize later when they get into root cause problem solving, they actually don't have a problem. Yeah, They're just working right. on something. But if they would have started with steps one and two with KPIs, with supervisors, that's how I do that by asking them, can you quantify the problem for me in some manner? 
Yeah, and I think what you said there is very important, and I'm reflecting a little bit myself, is getting people to write it down, and if possible, on a whiteboard, because what then happens is the whiteboard becomes the focus of the discussion, not the individual. Uh, and that's why I also think JR, the pattern we used in JR training can be very effective with whiteboards. Is, and we often get this feedback is the, the focus of the discussion becomes the content of the whiteboard. And people tend not to argue with that for want of a better word. So maybe Amanda, that's an important thing is to, as William said, is to get people to write it down on something that can be made common, a common focus. So William, our time's up. I uh, really appreciate um, what you've done here and uh, your you know your thoughts on this it's been an interesting one and I know it's not quite there yet and William just so everyone knows William will be at uh, CarterCon slash TWI Summit next year and we'll be expanding on what you've just heard and probably adding to what you've just heard so don't hold back with registering he's a great resource and uh, someone who's very very willing to share his learning and wisdom so thanks uh, William really appreciate your time here uh, very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Oscar. You, Oscar. Thank, Thank you, Lee, for your team. Thank you, Skylar, specifically. Bye, William. Thanks, Thank everyone. you, Oscar. Have, have a good day, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.